Did we miss anything? Feels like I've been waiting forever for that. Well, I got one question, Jean. Was it worth it? Well, that's pretty debatable, but hey, it's finally over and done with. Bumblebee, Dumblebee, Yellow Jacket, Blake and Yang, or my personal favorite, Bang, has, to no one's surprise, finally become canon. No more theorizing if it's going to happen, no more questions, and no fucking takebacks. Everyone gets to be happy, including the fans of the ship. Actually, to those said fans, I got one really important thing to say to you. Something that I have been waiting to say for a very, very long time. I'm happy for you. What? No memes, no bullshit. Look, you've seen the title. You know where I'm going with this. This next hour is gonna be... rough. That said, the last thing I want this to come off as is just me taking something so big away from you guys. It's not every day you get a payoff for something you invested so much time supporting and yearning for. It wasn't exactly my fight, I barely thought it was worth it, but there's no disrespect here. You hung in there, staked your claim, and Rooster Teeth delivered. I'm not gonna try to take that away from you. In fact, I'm glad it's canon now. More glad than anyone. Because you see, you guys get to have your fun over there, and now, now I get to have mine. Oh, and before I forget... Due to own personal biases I play towards, I do not care about the ship as a whole, rather how it is treated from both the audience and the writers, and fear the impact of what their relationship has on the story as opposed to them just being lesbian. Did you catch all that? Good, cause I'm not repeating myself. You see, it's been five to six years since this ship became truly prominent among the fandom, and they were... interesting. To anyone remotely familiar with the ship or the discussion surrounding it in the fandom, you can understand why. Friendships were lost, death threats were made, isms and foes were tossed around like candy, and the fan artists got their cash cow for the month. Lucky ass motherfucker. So, now that it's all over, I think it's about time we take a step back, look at what led us here, and what I think this ship means for the show. Spoilers. It came too little, too late. Fuck these! Or alternatively, perhaps I should call the title Too Fast, Too Slow, because that's exactly what the pacing was like for this ship. Bumblebee is far from the worst plot point in the show. It's not even the worst ship, canon or not. But if you literally sat me down with a gun to my head and asked me to point to an element of Ruby that best exemplifies this show's problems, well, it would have to be the White Fang subplot, but you know what, this is a close, like, third, maybe fifth. Volume 1 was where Blake and Yang's friendship began. Now, you notice the runtime of the video so far. I want to point out that the time it took me to get here was longer than the amount of screen time that friendship was given. Their introduction was cool, cause they actually didn't like each other at first. And they had some funny dialogue a bit here and there, but that's pretty much it. This was especially rough because Yang's character was in the wood chipper in this volume, with them barely doing anything with her at all. Meanwhile, Blake had a lot more development, you know, what with Weiss calling her the N-word and all. And while this was going on, Yang was just kind of standing there. So without further ado, let's hit Ground Zero. Volume 2, Chapter 6, Burning the Candle. Here's the sitch. Before this scene began, Blake had been worrying herself half to death trying to find out information about the White Fang. She's pushing other people away, she looks like a meth head straight out of Hot Topic, her grades are failing, and, for real this time, the prom's tomorrow! Needless to say, she's cattier than usual. That's not even funny, man. And shouldering a lot of responsibility. So, Yang pops in to smack some sense into her. She relates to Blake seeking answers and compares it to her own past by trying to find out her mother, Raven, who may as well be the dumbest bitch in the whole show, but that's a conversation for another time. The scene highlights that Yang and Blake have been through similar struggles in their lives. 
schools and can very much lean on each other and support each other because of it. Blake should postpone her goals to fight the White Fang at least for the night in order to enjoy her life until she is rested and has a fucking lead instead of wasting it trying to bite off more than she can chew. Gotta give props, one of the best scenes in the entire show, at least in isolation. The dialogue, visuals, and movements of the characters give us a clear idea of what these two are going through and that a strong bond has been made here or at least is starting to build up. And hey, the scene in Mountain Glen established all the characters' motivations. You know, not much of a Blake and Yang moment, but you know, it's decent. You know, I can't wait to see how they further develop this throughout the rest of the volume, and it's gone. So moving on to Volume 3, okay, wait, no, no, come on, there has to be something more, right? You mean to tell me that they didn't just give the two any other interesting interactions for more than a season, only to upend the entire relationship at the slice of an arm? Yes, yes I am. The worst part is that Yang fell victim to Adam, someone intrinsically tied to the White Fang subplot that's at the core of Blake's character. Yet prior to this, all Yang had done throughout the whole subplot was beating up a bunch of minorities and telling Blake to chill her crusade. Once. In the short term, it does showcase Blake's greatest fear, that her checkered past allowed someone she cares about to get hurt. In the long term, it feels like a huge stretch, because the two never had more than two conversations with one another. The parallels between Yang and Adam could have been utilized much more than this, much like this scene prior to that moment in Volume 3. It's sensible how Blake is wigged out by Yang allegedly crippling Mercury. She doesn't want Yang to be another Adam, someone so precious to her turning out toxic under the surface. I get it. But the conflict in the scene ended so abruptly, because apparently it's not enough to give the build up to one of the biggest emotional moments at the end of this volume any more setup. After that, there was nothing else until Yang was used as a prop to further Blake's conflict with the Skrillex knockoff. It did develop her further later, but everything leading up to it was kinda undercooked. And that's because Blake and Yang in these portions don't feel like much of a dynamic. There's barely any banter that's uniquely theirs. They almost never contribute to each other's development, and when it is, it's mostly growth on Blake's end. We didn't even get to see them braid each other's fucking hair, and yet we have this major plot twist. I'm supposed to be saddened by their friendship being lost, especially with Blake leaving, but we didn't get to see much of it for three fucking seasons. The first of the show, mind you. It would be like if the eclipse happened in the seventh episode of Berserk rather than where it was originally. Or better yet, keep the eclipse where it was and have all that development and camaraderie between the band of the hawk before that point. Yeah, cut that to like a third of what it was. The examples speak for themselves, it just wouldn't work. So the question is, what course does this set for both of our characters? But before getting into that, we need to talk about what a slow burn is and why almost no one's using it right. This phrase, to me, has been one of the most common defenses for the ship taking so long to get expanded upon. This phrase is supposed to mean a situation where the story takes its time to flesh out as much about a relationship or plot point as possible, putting them in new scenarios, recontextualizing them, and giving worthwhile obstacles that aren't solved too easily. Romance? It's often a foregone conclusion in stories, but when the pacing is slow, it often means that the story is taking a realistic approach, or one that best fits the characters, their flaws, and how overcoming them will eventually lead the pairing to each other. In a long-running story, this approach is pretty much the most appropriate. It allows you to explore as many shades of these pairings as you like, to the point where you can even have them start out not even liking each other at first, and don't even have have to have immediate chemistry. They can dislike each other in the beginning and would take a while to even warm up to each other as friends, not even partners. But either way, you should still give your audience enough reason to look forward to this dynamic. 
That said, this approach runs the risk of being too slow, taking too much time to have the characters suck faces or repeat a bunch of BS we've seen a dozen times already. This is why a lot of will they won't they stories don't work well most of the time, because at the end of the day, it's not about the time that you have, it's what you do with it. I say all this because very shortly, we'll find out that this wasn't a slow burn. It's the silence before a bombing. Despite knowing Yang's abandonment issues, Blake was so overcome by her fears that she ran away, allegedly to either protect her friends, even though that wouldn't work, or to rest and see her family, which we know was a lie. Who says I'm done fighting? The moment you left, I knew exactly what you were doing. You're going on a one-woman rampage against the White Fang! You're wrong, son. You're so, so wrong. What are you- I'm not going anywhere near the White Fang. Not yet. So that was a fucking lie. But whatever. So Yang is left to stew on her feelings of helplessness and anxiety. Though we get a large focus on the aftermath for these two, there's nothing that highlights the loss in their friendship. It would make sense that Blake would feel the most guilty about abandoning Yang due to her injury and issues, but we don't get to see that. It would also make sense for Yang to be angsty. Yangsty. I'll go sit in the corner. About why Blake left and feel hurt about it, but we don't get much of that in this volume either. This is why I brought up the slow burn crap. Many have argued that the ship took so long to get going in order to flesh things out, make the ending worth it. But in volume four, nothing is being done to expand on their relationship. There's subtlety and then they're sitting on your ass. It's not about the time they had, it's what they didn't do with it. Not to say they don't already have a lot going on in volume four, but there was barely a mention of their lost friendship during this time, which is a huge problem. The more time they ate up not doing much with this plot point, the more they had to go crunch time to make up for it. Volume 5 was that crunch. And it all starts with a couple of scenes. Let's break this scene down first, because as far as Volume 5 is concerned, this is all we get on Yang's end. Weiss has a heart-to-heart -heart with her, letting Yang know that though it's valid for her to be angry at Blake for leaving, knowing her, she probably had her reasons and should have faith in their bond that she should come back. Yang then begrudgingly agrees to forgive Blake, provided that she even comes back in the first place. So what's the problem here? As sensible as this conclusion seems, it was also way too fucking easy. As we discussed only moments ago, Volume 4 gave us nothing about Yang's thoughts on Blake's abandonment, and it's only now that we are even beginning to explore her insecurities after Volume 3. And on top of that, Weiss gives the perfect Dr. Phil response that addresses seemingly all of Yang's issues with Blake up until Volume 6 when Blake coddles her. A completely different conflict. Everything else was concluded in this scene. She never brings up Blake's abandonment in the future, she doesn't have too much difficulty trusting her, even in battle, and we don't even get to see Blake apologize on screen. Hell, in the opening fight of Volume 6, Blake and Yang are in sync with each other when fighting the Grimm despite being separated for a year and Yang debatably updating her fighting style. This is terrible, because it makes the conflict seem much more petty and small than it actually is for their character arcs. Pacing in storytelling is a simple concept to grasp, but difficult for most to define. Hence the slow burn fallacy from earlier. Every conflict, be it a plot or character, has a time and a place, and these two things are a writer's currency. Ideally, every integral plot point would have the necessary time to flourish as much as possible. Smaller conflicts require simple solutions, and thus faster pacing. But plot points that are more intricate and integral to the story will require more time, thus greater emphasis. Of course, this depends on the story's scope, so not all plot points are character arcs have to last the same amount of time. It's best to take things case by case, but the principle remains the same. As a writer, you have three questions. What is the point of this part of the story? How long should it last? And what do we do with that time? And for character conflicts, you have a fourth question. Would your characters react to each other this way given X amount of time? So with that in mind, let's think about Yang's reasons for being angry at Blake. 
Blake, for reasons the Beacon Arc failed to explore, was Yang's closest friend. Yang was there for her in her time of emotional need, revealing deeply personal things for the sake of Blake's peace of mind. Yet when the ball was in her court, when Yang was at her most vulnerable, she pulled an Aang and vanished. Which is already bad enough, but it's even worse given Yang's further characterization, which explores that she hates being coddled away from the harshness of the world, likely due to having to grow up so quickly at a young age in her belief in her own strength of will. So Blake, being unwilling to let Yang help her with the White Fang stuff, or leave as she did, came as the biggest bitch slap possible. It hurt her more than Adam ever could, on top of knowing of her abandonment problems. Yet Blake left anyway without explaining why, and leaving Yang for almost a year to seethe over all of this. On top of that, given the CCT towers being completely offline, Blake could have been dead for all Yang knew, and she would never see her again. What Blake did was fucked up and this should be deeply emotionally scarring for Yang. So, if you believe it makes sense for Yang to get over years of trauma that was unearthed by her closest friend betraying her in one five minute fucking conversation six to eight months after the fact, I'll see you in court for sexual harassment because you are pulling my dick right now! This pacing is terrible and it's an insult to what both of these characters are going through. Nothing displays this better than this freaking line. How could I be there for her if she doesn't let me? What if I needed her here for me? Um, why? No, seriously, why? Why do you like her this much? I know that she went out on a limb for Blake, but what is it about her that you feel like you need Blake with you? What has she added? What has she brought to the table except being another body to fight and being casual friends? This is despite the huge support network of people who either didn't abandon you or at least left a damn note before doing so. If anything, Blake would be the last person you want to be this attached to. Yet she is the one who gets the easy way out. But why when we never got to see what she offered her? You know what, actually, no, she did offer something to Blake, okay? It's because of the plethora of interactions and bonding moments that they've had in the first three volumes. Off screen. Gotcha, bitch! And you know the rules. If it didn't happen on screen, it didn't happen. The only way this scene would even work is by imagining an entire season's worth of events in my head to fill in the gaps. And if this shit was so important to you, Rooster Teeth, might I suggest that you do your job? Stop forcing the audience to make the story you want to write in their heads. If I were a fan of this ship, this scene would piss me off. There should should have been multiple scenes, in Volume 4 especially, that embellished this strain in their relationship. And it's not any better on Blake's end either. There was only one time Blake mentioned Yang at all concerning her guilt for running from all of her friends, and there was little emphasis on Yang in particular. Oh, or the time when she described her in a single word, that definitely didn't help. In fact, not only was that scene a complete waste of time pacing wise, but also in terms of Blake's development. She prattles on about how she thought Adam was the embodiment of based and blue pill before he yelled out Sieg Zeon. Ideally, this is where she'd realize that Adam and her friends are complex people that you can't label like a box of chocolates and that keeping up that mindset is very naive, devaluing the true character of the people around her. The show instead tells us that her problem was that she used the wrong label, and that's why she didn't see his evil. Man, this is some bullshit. But you know who she couldn't pin down that way? Son. What did you say? Yep. Yep, we're going there. Buckle up. Since the early volumes, Sun has pretty much appeared in almost every major portion of Blake's development, fighting off the White Fang, investigating them, having some nice banter with her, and even establishing mutual attractions. After Volume 3, he helped Blake get back on her feet, slowly but surely. And all the while, he learns a lot about her home, her feelings on Team Ruby, and even met her parents. And if that wasn't base enough, Sun gave Blake the push she needed to change. 
You can make your own choices, sure. But you don't get to make ours. When your friends fight for you, it's because we want to. So stop pushing us out. That hurts more than anything the bad guys could ever do to us. Not all of their scenes are as good as that one. I'm not much of a Black Sun guy, but this dynamic absolutely sold. I mean, let's look at the stats here. Sun is basically Beacon Arc Yang without the baggage that could bloat the runtime. He's consistently involved in Blake's main story arc, adds to her growth, and actually has some well-written charismatic banter with her. And it's all way more consistent than Yang ever was. Part of good pacing in character relationships is to make sure all parties involved consistently interact and adds to each other's arcs. Characters who are less relevant get less involvement, and vice versa, so it's often best to stick with the latter, especially when it's between two major characters. So if we want to talk about shit with proper pacing, then shit man, Sunny B here's what's up! So what's up with leaving that at the train stop, RT? And again, don't get it twisted, people. I would say the exact same thing in reverse. If Blake were blushing at Yang in Volume 3 or 2, if Yang gawked at Blake's dress in Volume 2, if Yang and Blake had a consistent dynamic for 5 fucking volumes before having them separate and Sun called Dib so suddenly, I would schedule the next flight to Texas to give the writers my biggest goddamn pimp slap. That would be fucking nonsense. If we're under the assumption that Kruby wanted Bumblebee to be canon for a while, and I am very much willing to believe them on that, they just wasted our time. Not only was Blake and Yang's friendship incredibly sparse, but we spent five seasons, five years, with a pairing with three times the screen time, three times the development, and three times the plot relevance. It's like leaving your wife of 13 years for the chick from the economics class you spoke to a couple times. It's incredibly jarring, especially since there isn't much of a shown reason for Blake to be more attracted to Yang romantically at this point much less give reasons for her lacking attraction to Sun after Volume 3. In real life, you can kind of get away with attractions being made and fizzling out over time just cuz. But we're watching a story. You have to give some reason for Blake to feel more attracted to Yang than Sun, despite dwarfing her contributions to Blake's arc in every way at this point. Before when I talked about pacing, I also mentioned the word emphasis, and this is an element of writing Ruby struggles with a lot. What your characters choose to notice or what story you devote the most time to is a clear example of showing the audience that this is a super important thing to focus on. Makes sense, really. If something lasts for more than an episode or a single scene, you'd naturally think it's important somehow. That is what emphasis is. It's basically what the writer chooses to frame in their story to show their priorities. And it can be useful. Usually, and even in some of the worst stories ever made, you don't really need to think about that because their priorities are absurdly still apparent. In Ruby, not so much, because here's the thing about emphasis, you always have to make the framing clear enough. If you focus on aspect or plot point and tell us that it's important, or is viewed in a certain way for a while only to renege our understanding arbitrarily, you basically wasted the audience's time by focusing on something you apparently don't care as much about. Case in point, by spending this much time with Sun and having him do the heavy lifting of character building with Blake, while giving Yang only a fraction of a fraction of a fraction of that time, it gives your audience fucking dementia when you decide to shift gears. So if Bumblebee was what they were going for, why didn't they give it more time? If Black Sun wasn't on the table, why did they give it as much time as they did? Honestly, I don't know. There's been a lot of speculation on this decision way before Bumblebee became canon, such as whether or not this was a publicity stunt, basically used to gain more views for the show. Due to Rooster Teeth's recent, uh, activities, doubting their earnest desire for the ship to happen is understandable. That said, I think it's pointless to do so. Barring Shane's letter to Electric Boogaloo, co-signed by every single on-the-ground member of Rooster Teeth, we are never gonna know if this is true or not. So let's call it what it is, a huge risk, but one that I'm not completely against. Why? Well, for one thing, Sun deserves better. 
Okay, jokes aside, Sun is also strapped to the most irrelevant part of the show plot-wise. Now that that's done and over with, keeping him around would bloat the cast, and having a long-distance romance with Blake would bring down investment in the pairing. I mean, it's going to take them five fucking seasons for the team to get the vacuo. Plus, it'd be better for Blake and Yang, since after Volume 5, most of their characters are just, uh, kind of over. Yang BTFO'd her mom, her PTSD is rarely mentioned, and if Blake didn't coddle her the next volume, she honestly wouldn't have had an issue with her. And we'll get to that! Blake reconciled with her family and friends, defeated racism, and if she hadn't stupidly let Adam go at the end of the volume, that whole plotline would be over too. And we'll get to that as well. This relationship is all they got left, and all the better if they can pull it off. But make no mistake, this is a huge if. From this point on, this ship is fighting an uphill battle. Not only do you have to give the pair interactions that rival five seasons worth of Black Sun, but you also have to air out and explore the dirty laundry Blake and Yang have with each other, and come back together as friends before even thinking about sucking faces. Then you'd have to give them new conflicts and struggles that are evolutions of what they've been through before, and give a satisfying payoff. Sounds like a lot? Well, TLDR, you ever heard of writing in hard mode? Yeah, these guys are doing it in critical mode. At level 1, every second of screen time, every line read, every play they make, and every scene has got to make bank. They gotta pull off four seasons in one shot. So let's see if they make it count. You see, this is what happens when you let a man cook. They tried to set things up well early on. The scene between them and the Brunswick Farms being a good example. Now that Blake returned to the group, she's trying to make up for what happened before. But in doing so, she's overcorrecting. Much like the writers did in this vlog. What Yang wanted was to take on their personal challenges together not to be coddled for the sake of her protection. It's a different conflict from before, but it's a clear evolution here. The climax of this conflict is of course them working together to beat Adam once and for all. So, where's the middle? Where, where's Malcolm? Where's Frankie Munez? <laughs> like really, what happened to that guy? She's not protecting me, Adam. And I'm not protecting her. We're protecting each other. Wow, and you didn't even need to talk together to learn that chestnut, didn't ya? How the fuck did Blake reach this epiphany right when this fight happened? For fuck's sake, they skipped time faster than King Crimson. They could have taken out the numerous scenes in this volume that went fucking nowhere. I don't think we even get to see Blake apologize to Yang for leaving on screen. Instead of having Jean be sad about Pura for the upteenth time, gaslighting Crow, stealing an airship because Miles said so, or if we didn't have fucking Genlock, we could have spent that time having Blake reflect on her actions and slowly come to figure out what she did wrong. Their fight was the second climax of the volume after all, and honestly the only part people remember the most. But instead, that shit was put on complete pause until they spammed the fast forward button. The big reason for their friendship breaking down in volume 3, aside from the clear trauma, was due to the two not communicating. They misunderstood each other's priorities and values, which hurt them far more than they knew. Blake felt so guilty and loathed herself so much that she didn't think that anyone, much less Yang, would be able to help carry her burdens. To her, it was all her fault, and she couldn't handle that happening again. Yang, for some reason, mistakenly thought that Blake was reliable enough to stand by her the way she did before, not understanding that the huge moment that happened here wasn't just big for her, but for Blake as well. She has a lot to work on, and the lesson she learned in Volume 2 didn't stick. It's not good enough. In fact, she didn't realize until later how badly Blake probably felt having to use all of her strength to get Yang to safety after the worst possible scenario. 
And now you're telling me they reached this point without speaking a damn word? Even before this fight, Blake and Yang have a laugh and give bedroom eyes. And the fight afterward is supposed to be the beginning of their budding relationship, with Adam being reduced to a fucking Redditor to make it happen. Others have rightfully pointed out how brain dead they made Adam here, or how contrived were the events leading up to it. Like deciding to steal an airship for no reason, so I won't copy their flow. But I want to point out that this is the guy they thought was the most fitting obstacle to bringing these two together. A try-hard, edgy, furry Elliot Roger. What a fucking joke. In fact, he was such a goddamn giggle that Yang saw him again and looked fucking bored. Blake has no guilt for letting the asshole run away and kill a few innocents just to get to her. Adam isn't even an obstacle, an emotional or physical challenge. He's just a wall, another action figure for their cool fight scene. That is not to say I'm against them fighting him to show how far they've come. Structurally, that makes complete sense, but they're fighting someone who is arguably just as fleshed out as their relationship. Given what we covered so far, that's not a compliment. You guys just can't stop making your job harder, can you? Do you have any idea how significant this moment should be for their characters? Finally, after all this time, Blake and Yang can prove that together they are more than the mistakes that they've made or the people who have wronged them and come together not out of obligation or guilt, but because they genuinely care for one another. Their relationship should have been built upon hard-earned communication and commitment, something that should be shown on screen, and it's a pact that they desperately need in their lives. But instead, they rush to the conclusion and have them fight a character that lacked any nuance at all. Something this potentially complex should not come from something this juvenile. Because just because this is a lesbian ship, doesn't mean you should lack any balls. You see, the last portion kinda had me a bit mad. This one makes me just goddamn giggle. <laughs> because despite these two's pairing being so beloved, they refuse to follow up on that. Instead, what we get are what I like to call bumble bites. Little bites of cutie interactions between Blake and Yang that are supposedly meant to endear you to this ship. They're not bad. They're not great either. They give us something we never really got before. Blake and Yang interacting casually. Personally, while these moments are harmless, they come off as kinda try hard to me. Maybe it's the voice acting, maybe it's the stiff as fuck animation trying too hard to be anime, or maybe it's because of the fact that not even a week before they started not dating in the universe, Blake and Yang fucking killed a man and we just got over that? I mean shit man, they just got back in each other's good graces. Like would they be closer? Hell yeah, but look at this! <laughs> Sorry, just not used to the new hair yet. Is it bad? No, no, it's good. Great even. They're practically dating already. Where's that slow burn people were talking about? If this was someone's idea of a slow burn, I wouldn't let them do barbecue. After the trauma they've been through, it would have been better to have them reconnect as friends before doing the cutesy relationship stuff. It's like the show is training me to anticipate their pairing rather than giving me reasons to want it. This wouldn't be terrible if other aspects of their characters weren't thrown into the shredder. Yang's not GF, doesn't seem to care about faunus racism, or even if Jacques Schnee, furry slaver extraordinaire, would win the election in arguably the most racist country on Remnant, and Blake's not GF, cares even less. But what else is new, people? They'd rather do Fortnite dances, substitute character development with combo attacks, or lie to the one guy who gave her back her arm, despite having a Kara moment over secrets a few weeks ago. And on that topic, we of course get very little of their thoughts on lying to Ironwood at the start of the volume. All this on top of barely interacting with other characters, exploring different sides of themselves and each other. Sure, they're happy and goofing around, but I barely got much of a sense of what attracts the two other than their shared trauma. Not to say that's a bad foundation for a well-written pairing, but there needs to be more from that. That's what these small bits and scenes try to convey, but it hardly ever sells me on them. 
They're meant to be fun, but the chemistry is so dry due to the show's generally poor comedy, and it barely does anything interesting with the interactions. For most of the volume, they do nothing plot relevant either, aside from beating up a bunch of Grimm. In fact, remember that time Bumble 2B hoodwinked an interaction with Robin from Nora, even though up to this point they straight up didn't care? Blake, we did what we had to do. Really now? No choice have you. Okay, so his aura is down, he's reaching for the blade yang, just shoot him. Shoot him, just shoot him. Shoot, shoot his leg, why aren't you shooting his leg? Why are you- No, stop! Shoot! Fucking- Well. Okay. Well. Okay, you kind of brought that trauma on yourself, dog. I don't know. So yeah, moving on. Not a lot happens here since the two are separated from most of the volume. But a la volume 5, we get one scene for each that's worth a damn before the finale. So, uh, let's start with something familiar. Remember that time I said this? TLDR, she goes to Blake for relationship advice. I did not stutter. This isn't a prank. You're not having a stroke. And no, you're not in a simulation. Yeah, I forgot to mention what that advice was, didn't I? When you've been at someone's side for so long, after a while they become a part of you. But that's just it. They're only a part of you. Don't forget about the rest. You see, Blake's advice to Noor rings insanely hollow. Not just because of how bad Noor's arc is this volume, but also because Blake's character is defined by two things. Shit social commentary and relationship drama. All four of them. All of her dialogue outside of scenes like this is interchangeable with any other character. Her personal interests and distaste are either left behind in the earlier volumes or used for shit comedy. And like I said, ever since a lot of her arc was dealt with in volume 5 and 6, she barely has much of a character of her own that's expressed. The only thing not related to those things is her family, which I doubt the rest of the cast even knows about. In fact, Blake has never spoken to Yang on screen about her parents or what she thought of them. You know, how interesting would that be, seeing them compare and contrast familial experiences? You know, that's some character building shit right there. So speaking of character and shit, how's Yang doing? Well, after she talked down to Ren, she said this to Jean. Do you think she thinks less of me for not helping out with Amity? Now, Jean, being a normal fucking human being, thought, oh, you mean your sister, who you just had a fight with literally like yesterday or today, I guess? Something that literally never happened before? And to anyone watching this scene going in, you'd be right. And Rooster Teeth hates you. Yeah, Ruby. Shut up, bitch! So, let me get this straight. Instead of fleshing out the conflict Yang had with Ruby from the beginning of the volume, they decide to make this a Blake thing. Despite not arguing with her in that scene, despite agreeing to split up, and despite y'all only being apart for a fucking day. Like, bro, she took it harder than a kid whose dad left for milk. It makes Yang seem low-key obsessive here, while Blake around this time is focused on the mission. This is Volume 5 Yang all over again, and it somehow makes less sense than before. If they wanted to give the two conflicts, they should have set that forward from the start of the volume. Part of good pacing is knowing when to start the shit you're writing about, and they missed their bus on day one. This makes the scene at the end of the volume where their stupid plan nearly killed them even more weightless. People have already talked at length about how Yang being sent to the Shadow Realm was dumb on so many levels. Not to mention how selective the characters' reactions are. Aside from this being a clear fake out because there's no way they kill off their most popular character before the ship became canon, even at the moment I just felt nothing. Let's review our notes, class. The first three volumes did jack for Bumblebee as a friendship, much less a pairing aside from a couple of convos, yet want us to feel bad about the falling out. Four and five did nothing to explore their falling out before getting back in each other's good graces, with barely any conflict. During this time, they threw in the red herring of a potential partner who contributed way more to Blake's arc, yet got benched without much of a resolution. 
Six revolve what was left of their conflict in the most rushed way possible, caused by absurd amounts of plot contrivance and stupidity on both sides. And seven and eight basically made them lovers in every sense except name, despite six happening practically yesterday for these two. And now, like fucking poetry, they want us, the audience, to feel bad about their potential deaths. Again. Did you get all that? Good. Pop quiz time. What one word can describe the core issue with this ship? Shut up, bitch! If you guess time, you'd be correct. Time is Ruby's greatest enemy. Whether it be time it is wasted, time the writers misused, or time it doesn't have. The show was made with a great amount of passion and vigor behind it. And I'm not gonna sit here and discount how much of a huge undertaking this project was, especially for a studio as small as theirs starting out. Everybody clearly worked hard in order to make the show what it is, even now. But you can't just be passionate, you've got to have vision. You can't just know the end, you need to know how to get there. And all they've ever been was wasteful. Let's put things into perspective. Most of Ruby's volumes are around 12 episodes long, and most episodes are under 15 minutes. On top of that, volume 9 aside, every season of the show was made one year apart from the other, with less than half of each year being spent ironing out the damn script. Hence the constant, constant crunch time. All while being written by amateurs and having the budget of a McDonald's double cheeseburger. This would be fine if they were able to use that time effectively. Smartly constructing plot points that don't fill up too much of the runtime, and building character arcs that they can potentially conclude at the same time, and interweave with one another. And not piling on plot points or arcs that require much more time to flesh out than they can give. Apparently, when Rooster Teeth had that memo, it was opposite day. They wasted so many opportunities to establish things about the world or characters to make later scenes work, which affects something as simple as what the characters told one another. Yang's mom? Why did you say that name? Instead, they crammed everything but the kitchen sink in the early volumes with so many characters, concepts, and ideas, and then cut to volume 3 where they shifted the tone, setting, and goals for our characters on top of laying the groundwork to delve into harder topics. The foundation of the story was already shaky as is, but they pulled a freaking Shyamalan on top of that. Monty and Kruby were so impatient about shifting the paradigm of the show to reach newer heights despite having less than half the runtime of most shows with a similar structure. They want to go deeper into the characters' identities, flesh out the story, and want these relationships to matter. But they keep repeating the same mistakes. Many scenes in the early volumes could have been cut to better establish Blake and Yang as stronger friends to make their separation worth it. Volume 4 could have put a bit more time and effort to their reactions to what had happened. Volume 5 was a complete waste. Volume 6 rushed the conclusion and the list goes on. The biggest thing I want you people to take away here is that this shit ain't new. This isn't a Bumblebee problem. And this isn't a post-Monty era problem either. This tumor is in the show's DNA. It's why you didn't hear much of me say the whole spiel about Bumblebee taking away from Yang and Blake's other relationships, because that's an issue every character has, and it's why the writers expect you to buy into their story without giving a single bit of context. The characters will say and do things as if what's going on are some of the core aspects of their character built from information that was pulled from thin air. It's all gone. There's nothing left for me to go back to. Excuse me, uh, the, uh, the fuck did you just say? And this isn't counting the times when they establish a conflict or story element only to have it on pause and then thaw it when it doesn't naturally fit in the story. Conflicts are established where they shouldn't and are ended where they should. Oh, but we can't worry about that, okay? So what if we have to rush all of this? In Rooster Teeth's mind, we gotta get to the next set piece, the next big moment, the new set of nothing characters, and the next anime to pilfer. It's exhausting. 
And even worse, it's predictable. Because now, they have to keep playing catch up with their own show, endlessly overcorrecting on mistakes far past their expiration date. Like Bumblebee itself, they sat on their hands far too much, being giddy about the ideas they had in their heads, but almost never putting them to paper when they should. The power of zero in mocap. Every step forward is another several leaps back. Too much time's been wasted, and they don't have enough of it. It's all so unfortunate. Cause the scene where they got together was... Excellent. A bit schmaltzy, a bit tryhard, but excellent. The build-up towards it was nothing special. As soon as the two got together in totally not Wonderland, it's back to more Bumble Bites. But there's a growing sense that the time to pull the trigger was getting really close. And that time is here. We need to get to that platform! But how do we take the next step? Hey, I said it was beautiful, not subtle. And given what this scene is supposed to accomplish, which is having Yang and Blake finally fucking talk about their feelings, a lack of subtlety is actually a bit appropriate. This situation is a good conveyance of where they are mentally. Because they've yet to take the next step, despite wanting to, both Blake and Yang prevent themselves from being on the same page. In relationships, what's the most important thing? Well, most people would say simple communication. The only way to move forward is clearly conveying how they feel and what they like about each other. They meet halfway a bit. They compliment each other, they hang with each other, but as long as it's all kept ambiguous, it's gonna keep them apart. They were lucky to survive and meet each other again after Volume 8. Before anything crazy happens, now's the time to take the lead. There's a lot I like about this scene, but there's one thing that really stood out to me. You know, aside from the great body language and facial expressions. Props to you animators. In making this video, there were a lot of little hints and touches I'd never noticed before. Like Yang staring listlessly and longingly at a small pile of books in Volume 4. Or the fact that while others gawked and marveled at Yang's arm, Blake's the only one to touch and treat it like her own hand. A sign of her mistake, but also of Yang's resilience, something that she loves about her. Little details like these really do a lot for me, and the little touch in this scene is how the roles are both kind of reversed from burning the candle. Usually, Yang is boisterous and confident, while Blake is courageous but kind of reserved. But in this, Catgirl knows what's up, and now Yang has to be brave to take the chance that they both want, need to take. Like I said, time to pull a trigger. Now, they have the one thing they both wanted, something well-defined, something safe, genuine. They both wish for a bond that didn't need to be proven or judged, one that neither can misuse or abandon. This is a bridge they've built together. They changed one another, each earning a place in the other's heart, their soul. Not because of what they want from each other, but because of what they have to give. A bright sun on one end and a calming darkness on the other. The strength to grow and the strength to change. Yang and Blake, Bumblebee. That's what it's always been about. That's what it's always been for, people. Yo, Kaiser, how's it hanging? What you doing? Oh my gosh, it's Co Blaze Fate, co host of the New Types Podcast. Otherwise known as Serial Navigator CBF. I can subscribe. Please do. But yeah, I'm not doing much, buddy. I'm just. Actually, crazy thing just happened. You're not gonna believe it. Bumblebee is finally canon. The scene where they get together. It's actually, it's actually pretty good, man. Oh yeah, the crazy bastards actually did it, huh? Let's see it. All right, sure. So, few questions. Why are they here? Oh well, okay. So you know, in this volume, they're in like not Wonderland, right? Yeah, the freaking Destiny Islands from Kingdom Hearts. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So, while they are in this dimension, they kind of got sucked into this pocket dimension storm thing that puts them in like a representation of their mental hang-ups. And the only way to escape is if they confess their feelings. It's, uh, pretty quality stuff. 
Huh, that sounds weird and arbitrary. Otherwise, that sounds cool and all, but... Let me ask, did their refusal to confess cause any kind of conflict, tension, just awkwardness, or anything before this? Was- was this a thing at all until now? Uh, no. They were pretty chill with each other before this. Now you think about it. So, this wasn't connected to their whole arc or character drama this arc. Was it connected to any of that this episode? Or to the main plot? Or anything? Oh. Oh no. So what you're telling me is, this was just dropped in the middle of the episode. It had none to really do with everything other than to just force them to confess without it happening naturally. Why do you like this again? What am I fighting for? We just can't have nice things, can we? What makes this worse is that they could have decided to move forward with this on their own. The two nearly died and thought they'd never see each other again. Couldn't they have just slowly decided that there was no time like the present and just went from there? Or if they really wanted to force this out of them, you could show how their continued closed off actions have caused some disconnect that they still need to fix. You can even have it get in the way of battle a few times. Either way, the through line they have for this scene is absurdly messy. And that sucks, because despite that, I really, really like this scene. I like how we finally got this whole thing over with, and I'm still happy people enjoy it. Again, the real MVPs of this scene are the freaking animators and sound designers, and even the voice actresses for pouring their hearts out in this scene. But not even the script can save it. Maybe it's saying things we never said to each other. Alright, that's a huge reach, Blake. It could have been just complimenting each other. I mean, it would be nice to see her try just doing that at first and still not getting to the middle until she figures out it's about what she just said, but fuck it, whatever. You're always the first to lighten a situation. Uh. Bastard! Tell him we're not done yet! No, this is different. You act bravely when you're afraid. You do what you say. Uh... No more lies. No more half-truths. Ever since, well... Uh, suddenly Oz wasn't there anymore. Did you learn anything from him about the relics before... He told us the lamp can answer three questions. But all the questions were used up already. So that was a fucking lie. I like that you've never been intimidated by me. Okay, they just pulled that shit out of their ass. Where the fuck was this? When the hell was this ever a barrier for Yang to make friends? She had a few going into a beacon and clearly made nice with Team Juniper. What the fuck are you talking about? But you never gave up on them, even when they hurt you. You never give up. Other than Ilya, not really. She left Adam, for justified reasons, and would have still been mad at Weiss if she didn't pinky swore to not be racist. Blake only gave gave her a chance after Weiss made the effort. So other than Weiss and Ilya, who else did she not give up on? And hell, I'm not even sure if she even knows about Ilya in the first place. Do you see what I mean? I can't just lose myself in the moment because... Because, well, Bumblebee isn't just the moment, isn't just a moment. No story can be just a moment. It's the sum of its parts. And if Kruby care as much about the ship for as long as they say that they have, all of the parts here should have been more their weight in gold instead of rusted. It's emotionally gripping, yes, but fleeting. And the worst part is, I saw it coming. In 2019, after Volume 6 ended, the ship was at the height of discussion for obvious reasons. And during that time, I made this script, the very script that you're hearing right now. Refined, of course, but you know. Before my Aesop's video, among others, this would have been my very first video. I could have released this script after Volume 6 as I had planned, I could have made it after Volume 7, and I definitely could have made it during Volume 8. But I didn't. There's a couple reasons for that. One reason, of course, is the general rule of my channel. If there's something that I can add to the conversation that 
not many other people are pointing out, then I'm gonna fucking talk about it. But if not, I'm just not gonna do so. Because overall, I not only want to express my thoughts, but also to add to the greater discussion. And if I've ever done that in some minute way over the course of this channel's history, all the better for it. Aside from that, there's a bigger, more important reason than that. I wanted to give Miles and Carrie a chance. Man, what the fuck is you what talking about? What the fuck was that? Nigga, I'm hey, sorry, man. man. No, I, was, man. I wasn't man. thinking about you it. Always no, I did. I, I should have said. As I said in the volume 5 section, there were ways they could make this ship work. I promised myself that if they actually stuck the landing here with everything after that point, I would turn this video into one of my absolute praises for this ship. Needless to say, I'm disappointed. But that aside, I'm a nitpicker of my word. So let me set the record straight right here, right now. Every single problem that I've stated in this video, aside from adding a few things here and there that embellish all of my issues with Bumblebee, have not changed since the year of our Lord 2019. We are in 2023 and nothing has changed. And that is honestly sad. They really just cannot stick the landing. If the confession is any sign at all, this is proof they could have done so much more with the ship. It was endearing, animated beautifully, and fit with very simplistic and neat character drama. And other scenes related to this ship have their good points as well. If they gave anywhere near as much attention to detail, if the script was ironed out a bit more, if we just had more time, this could have been the best thing to ever happen in the show. And I really want to hammer this shit home, people. I'm going off script here. You, you pull a men in black, right? You wipe my brain of every single memory I ever had about this story, about this show, about anything. And you'd be like, hey, Kaiser, wanna go to Starbucks? I'd be like, okay, sure. All right, and we sit down, we have coffee or whatever, and you break down the, the, the general outline of this ship. You don't give me all the details about, uh, you know, the actual pacing of it or blah, blah, blah. You just give me the broad outline, the structure of where everything is supposed to be. This would sound like the best relationship story ever fucking written in my eyes. It has everything I could ever want, both aesthetically and narratively. And they fucked up. And I really, really wanted this to work. Or maybe it's all just copium. I, I just don't know anymore. And I cannot describe how, how much it sucks, really. Almost every day since the episode where they kissed was aired, I've seen people talk so much about how great this moment was for them, both as long-time fans and those longing for gay representation. Hell, even many people say that this is an accurate portrayal of sapphic romances. They say that they actually see themselves or their friends in this pairing, in this moment. That it was honest and real to them and spoke to them in a way that no other show in any other medium ever has or ever could. I can't speak to that experience. But they must have struck some kind of gold if this many people liked it so much. I just think these people deserve better. So agree to disagree. I meant what I said. I'm happy for you. But I got my priorities. For me, Bumblebee is just too little, too late. But maybe for you, it came just at the right place at just the right time. And that's alright.